And so it's hard to believe that the national checkoff, that original dollar per head checkoff, has been in existence for more than 30 years. It is, it is your self-help program being able to reach consumers in the area of promotion, research, and education. And our mission today, as it has been for more than 30 years, is to help be a catalyst to increase beef demand. The national checkoff has allowed you to do what you do best, and that's to raise the best beef cattle in the world. But the checkoff has also given you a tool to reach those consumers and help address the many questions that they have today versus what they had 30 years ago. And as I think about that consumer over 30 years, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences. Diet health was important 30 years ago, just as it is today. But as you've heard from many of the speakers today, the consumer today wants to know more about what you're doing than there ever has been. They want to know that you're taking care of your animals. They want to know that you're taking care of the environment. They're talking about hormones, antibiotics, and the, and the list goes on and on and on. And so the checkoff is giving you a platform to be able to have that discussion on a daily basis with consumers to really address those questions they might have or break down some barriers as far as why they don't consume our product. So when you went to vote on the National Beef Checkoff back in 1986, and some of you probably weren't born in 1986, but we're going to go through this history lesson anyway, it was built around really five or six simple tenets. Number one, every time cattle are sold, a dollar's collected. Y'all be, many of you may be surprised that importers pay the dollar per head on live cattle and the equivalent to a dollar head on beef that comes into the country. So you didn't want any free riders, so you wanted everybody to participate. Producers, you wanted grassroots control. And so as you look at the directors that represent the beef checkoff through the Cattlemen's Beef Board, those directors are nominated by certified state organizations. Those nominations go up to the Cattlemen's Beef Board and they send them on to the Secretary of Agriculture and he or she is the one who actually appoints those directors to serve on the national level. Producers, you wanted half the dollar to go to the national and you wanted the state beef councils to oversee the other 50 cents. You also didn't want to create a new bureaucracy. And so as you look at the administrative expenses of the Cattlemen's Beef Board, it's capped at 5%. It's been that way since 1986 and it's that the way it is in, in 2018. And so when the checkoff actually, the national checkoff actually began in 1986, we ran the program for 18 months to give you an idea of, and show you how we were going to be investing your dollars. During that 18 month time frame, you were able to ask for a refund on that original dollar. And so you'll remember in May of 1988, you went and voted on a referendum whether to keep the national checkoff or throw it in the dumpster. So nationwide it passed 79% and in Texas 89%. So Texas producers have long understood the importance of promotion, research, and education. So as you think about the programs that we execute on your behalf, it's all about the movement of cattle. Every time cattle is sold, a dollar is collected, those dollars are used for promotion, research, and education. And so as you think about, and we've talked a little bit about this already today, we've talked about the drought. I could go back and with historical collection information and tell you on a yearly basis up till 2010, 2011, 2012, I could honestly tell you we would collect roughly $12 million every year in Texas. Some years I'd be a little high, some years I'd be a little low, but I was in the ballpark. And so half of that $12 million would go to the Cattlemen's Beef Board and the Texas Beef Council would oversee the other half. And so what happened in 2011? We all know what happened. We saw huge sell-offs. We saw a lot of cattle going out of the state. Obviously, as with cattle movement, revenues were through the roof at an all-time high. But what happened the following year, just like you sell them off and then there's no revenue. Well, there's still revenue, but not at the same level that you had historically seen. So the boards of the Texas Beef Council, and this, and this is more than just T Texas Beef Council. This drought lingered in Texas. It went up through the beef belt in 2012. So hard decisions were having to be made 
not only by the Cattlemen's Beef Board, but state beef councils like the Texas Beef Council. And so we began the process of trying to right size the programs based on what we projected revenues to be in the future. And we know that the only thing that was going to help us increase revenue numbers was rain. And of course, we never know when it's going to rain, and hopefully the, the good Lord will bless us with that rainfall. And so as we began right-sizing the programs, the Board of Directors of the Texas Beef Council, we sat down and said, okay, these are the programs we're going to eliminate, we're going to reduce to come in line with the revenue projections for the, for the foreseeable future. And so as we began that process, the board members would sit around and say, those are good programs we're cutting. And I said, yeah, they are, but we got a job. we got to right-size the programs based on the revenue. And so as we went through that discussion, they went back to their respective organizations, and our board is made up of really all the major cattle organizations in the state, from cattle feeders to farm bureau to cattle raisers to livestock markets to purebred sector to, to LMA uh, to dairy. And so they're going back and talking to their membership and said, guys, we're, we're having to cut a lot of really good programs, and the only way that we're going to continue to have a consistent voice to be able to reach the consumer is we, we, it might be a good idea to go ask the Texas producers if they would be willing to support another dollar head process, assessment. And that's what happened. Andy mentioned this. In June of 2014, you had the opportunity to go vote on a referendum to see if you'd be willing to support an additional $1 per head assessment in the state of Texas, a refundable $1 per head. And so after the vote was certified on October 1st of 2014, the state checkoff actually began. So in Texas, and there's other states around the country that have an additional assessment. So in Texas, there is a $2 assessment. One's the federal dollar. And for all cattle and calves that are sold in Texas, another there's another assessment so as you think about that and you say well what does it look like and so one of the things that we went through and talked about as it relates to having programs that complement each other and so producers and the organization said we want an organization that is able to best maximize my dollars in the broad area of promotion research and education promoting beef and beef products, be able to invest those dollars in Texas, the United States, and the international market. If you look at the board makeup of the Texas Beef Council and the Beef Promotion Resource Council of Texas that oversees the state checkoff, that's a 20-member board, so there's consistency there. And as you look at the ability to spend dollars, we cannot use any dollars from either the national checkoff or the state checkoff for lobbying activities or to influence government policy or regula regulation. The two biggest differences between the state and the national checkoff is the state checkoff is a refundable program, provided you give us a proper documentation. And secondly, the Beef Promotion Research Council of Texas oversees a whole dollar versus Texas Beef Council's overseeing 50 cents of the national checkoff program. So as we look at this and you think about these checks, you're all probably very familiar with the red check. I would hope so. That program has been in existence for 30 years. The red, white, and blue check it gives you an example of these are your checkoff dollars that are being utilized under your state checkoff program. So as we go through the rest of the program today, I want you to keep these percentages in mind. Who brings the money to the table as it relates to any program we're conducting on your behalf? So, some people ask me how important has a state checkoff been to what you do? And I would say it's about a 70-30 split. And so what I'm telling you is it has given us the ability to do things and conduct programs that we could have only dreamed about four to five years ago. And that's why I'm here today is try to help share some of that information with you so you can better get a better understanding. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on research, but it is the foundation of everything we do every program we do, and it helps us guide us in, as we move forward. And so, again, I can't explain and express how important that is. And whether it's the muscle profiling study that you funded several years ago, doing a better job of identifying individual muscles from the chuck in the round to help maximize the value of the chuck in the round, 
And so in that process, we were able to identify some new beef cuts that have become very popular. And whether that's the, the flat iron steak, whether that's the petite tender or the ranch cut, those are things that are happening that are probably not as visible to you, but are very important as far as laying the groundwork. I can honestly tell you today's beef is safer than it ever has been, thanks in part to your beef checkoff program. And whether that's through your beef quality assurance efforts or doing research on developing beef safety intervention protocols that are implemented in the packing plans. They're making our product safer today, our product is more consistent today, and the quality of our product is certainly much improved. We also use your dollars to understand the consumer. And I'm sure if you look at this group, there's probably some of those in your house, in your family. And so as we think about target audiences, it helps us understand why they purchase beef or in some cases why they don't purchase beef. But this is the millennial audience, is the target audience that we're looking at. They're gonna be buying our product way longer than me, I can promise you. But if you look at the, some of the characteristics that are up there, there's one thing that really jumps out at me. That's a group and that's a segment of our industry that is more wired in, and I'm talking about wired in through the computer and all the tablets and all the smartphones than any, ever, any generation that's come before them. That's where they live, that's how they get their information. So it's important for us to recognize that and be able to address those issues and to have that consistent conversation. So the state beef checkoff came into existence in October of 2014. So what I want to do is kind of take a, a journey with you, and Andy's big about taking the journey, so I'm going to keep on going down the journey, but I want to share with you some of the things that you have helped create in the last two or three years, and I want to introduce you to Beef Loving Texans. And so the Beef Loving Texans brand is to help connect consumers to the beef they love from the men and women who raise it. It's a community built around Texas pride, heritage, and our shared love of beef. And we're working to inspire mealtime solutions that create special moments and balanced lifestyles with beef. Beef loving Texans is a celebration of all it means to be a true Texan and to take pride in its state, its heritage, to embrace family and community, to evolve with change, endure challenge, and to believe that Cattle and beef are the heart of our culture. Beef-loving Texans, well, maybe more in Texas, maybe than other places, food and family really define who we are. It's that brisk recipe that's been handed down from generation to generation or that new upcoming chef that's creating the, ne the next beef item. But it's over 100 years of ranching and just as many ways of preparing and sharing the product of those ranches that really make Texas truly unique. Our mission is really simple. It's to turn more Texans into beef-loving Texans because our passion for our home state and our dedication to the people, the men and women, and the communities who raise this country's best beef is really what gives us confidence in our mission. And so I know most of you are from Texas. But I know we've got, I think, looking at the deal, there's probably some that are outside. Ten states represented, so if they want to be a beef-loving Texan, I'm all for that too. But as we think about this, and we think about how we've executed on this brand awareness campaign and, and amplified the beef message, uh, we've gone back to, with the state checkoff, we've been able to go back to some of those tried and true media platforms that we've used to utilize 10 to 15 years ago, but I can tell you the digital platform is where we're moving and have been moving. And so let's take a look at some of those platforms over the last couple of years. Most of you are very familiar with Texas Monthly. Uh, when we launched the Beef Loving Texan campaign, we had three two-page inserts in the Texas Monthly campaign, uh, reaching more than 7.9 million consumers. Cook like a Texan, grill like a Texan, and celebrate like a Texan were the three placements that we had in Texas Monthly. With your state checkoff, we've also been able to use a platform that we had never used in Texas in 30 years, and that's billboards. 
I don't know how many, we don't have a lot of billboards up in the panhandle. They are in the larger rural areas that we do have them in, in uh, not the larger rural areas, the larger suburban areas, but in rural areas as well. And so you're the first group that will actually see the billboards that are actually going up right now. Uh, they'll be going up uh, as of May 1st and will run through Labor Day weekend. Many of those billboards will stay up until they can get a replacement, so those billboards may be up six or eight months before, the, before they're replaced. We're also utilizing your dollars uh, to reach consumers in radio, specifically Pandora Radio, and uh, we'll reach, again, this, we'll be run, launching a new radio campaign on uh, May 1st. We'll reach over 2.3 million Texas through Pandora Radio. And then one of the things that, uh, if I hadn't been asked once, I've been asked a thousand times, why don't I ever see anything on TV? And so as we think about that original dollar that you invested through the national checkoff, one of the things we know is that there has been an erosion of purchasing power of a dollar. A dollar today buys about what, 40, 40 cents about what it did in 1986. So we've had to become smarter nationally. We've had to be able to try to sharpen our pencil just like you've done. But this state checkoff has enabled us to have a platform, and it's a digital television platform in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. So I want to play for you the original Beef Loving Texans radio spot that, that aired, I guess that was May of, of 2015. So if you'll play that. Texas, it's a big state, but somehow that brings us closer together. Only in Texas do we have big cities with tight communities, small towns with huge heart, and brisket at every stop in between. Only in Texas do we define family not just by who you share your name with, but who you share a state with. And only here will you find the values and pride that make us not only Texans, but beef-loving Texans. So I know most of you probably have not seen that commercial, but it is out there. We've developed another one. There will be another commercial that's coming out uh, next week. We're still trying to put the finishing touches on that. But in addition to the traditional, we've also, uh, some of the things that we're looking at, again, it comes back to the digital platform. And as we look at that is we've spent the last couple of years really redeveloping the content to be more engaged with that millennial audience that comes to that Beef Loving Texan website. Uh, last year we had over 480,000 unique visitors. And it's a good way to to provide information, and it is a one-stop shopping for all things beef, and whether that's recipes, whether that's cooking tips, whether that's diet health information, uh, shopping ideas, uh, and the last thing we worked on really hard over the last year is Texas Stories. It's to, to share our story about beef and how it brings families and communities together. So as we think about the Texas videos, uh, again, a lot of time and energy were put in, into these. Uh, these are help us better engage that millennial audience, uh, delivering those memorable and relevant messages directly to consumers. So again, if you have the chance to go on the Beef Loving Texan website, I would encourage you to do so to kind of see how your dollars are being utilized and see what the Texas stories are all about. Digital platform, again, I can't stress how important it is, and I'm not a big I'm not on a lot of these, but I know a lot of y'all are. But I know that these, these platforms drive about 68% of the traffic to the website. Whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, or Twitter, it gives us the opportunity to have a consistent, constant discussion or dialogue with that target audience. And again, our, that target audience is the millennial generation. We also, in addition to digital, uh, is going back to some more traditional stuff, Developing content, and whether we're on morning shows or new time shows in primary and secondary markets, or we're developing uh, beef recipe stories or beef information that we're distributing either to digital to the online platform. Uh, we're ge generating, last year we generated more than 169 stories, reaching more than 67 million impressions. So kind of switching gears here, we're going to move into your beef team. Uh, this is a group of over 1,200 fitness fanatics who understand the benefits and the value of including beef in their diet as they fuel their body for physical activity. And so 
As I think about the beef team, and then I think you as a beef community, and I see the passion that you have about raising the best beef in the world, and the passion the beef team has about representing you to understand the, the nutritional benefits of beef, there are a lot of similarities. These people give back to their communities just like you do. And so we put together this, this video, it's on YouTube, and I thought it might capture that, and you might see the, the, not the differences, but how similar the beef community is with the beef team. So if you'll play that video. It's more than just something we do. It's who we are. It's a way of life. A bond we share. A community. And when we serve, when we push, when we play, when we accomplish, when we come together, when we finish, at the end of the day, it's not just for us. And it's not just for our team. It's for the thousands of hardworking families across the state who work from sunrise to sunset to bring that delicious meal to our table. We're beef-loving Texans, and we're proud to support a healthier Texas. To find out more about our community, go to www.txbeefteam.org. You know, I've always liked that video. It kind of makes you feel good about what you're doing. And whether you're on the beef team or raising the best beef in the world, it kind of tugs at your heartstrings. But you've asked us for many years to build a healthier Texas. And what better way to build a healthier Texas than through beef and through understanding the, the nutritional benefits of beef. And so there isn't a month that doesn't go by, I'm telling you at the state or national level, that your dollars are not, try, are not being utilized to talk about how great the product is, the nutritional profile, and that beef should be included in a low-fat, heart-healthy diet. And whether we're partnering with different health organizations, and whether it's the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, working with like HEB and their Slim Down Showdown program, or Marathon Kids, Again, it's important that we have those partnerships. And to be quite honest with you, the, the reason they partner with us is not because they love your cowboy lifestyle. Now, they do like it. But why they partner with you is because you bring the sound science to the table. And that's really that's what separates us from a lot, a lot of other proteins. Last year, we participated in more than 15 medical and health conferences. Uh, providing the latest, greatest information about the nutritional benefits of beef. Uh, beef in an optimal lean diet is a, is a research project that is paying huge dividends as an industry uh, as it relates to uh, folks that, you know, have questions about including beef and that might raise my cholesterol level. Well, that's not the case, but I want to talk about this project right here. It's one that I'm very excited about and have been for the last two and a half years. How many of you have gone to the, your cardiologist, or you've had a friend go to your cardiologist or a physician, and they, you come back from that visit and said, oh man, they told me to reduce my consumption of beef. Has anybody had that, that opportunity? You know, that's a frustrating thing for the men, for us that's sitting in this room, knowing that we raise a great product. And we said, well, enough's enough. We provide a lot of information to the diet health community, but we said, we've got to do a better job. We've got to figure out a new way to reach those physicians with the beef message. And so we began this journey. And I will tell you, this project would not have happened without the state checkoff. So we said, we're going to identify the physicians in Dallas and Houston that see a minimum of 300 high cholesterol patients a month. And business is good in Dallas and Houston, I promise you. And so before we started this journey, we said, well, we need to get some feedback from this, these, this community. So we had focus groups in Dallas and Houston. We brought 
30 doctors and cardiologists in Dallas and in Houston together and said, here's all the research as it relates to B. And there's probably 10 or 15 that we went through and said, tell us which ones resonate best with you. Which one tells the story about the importance of including beef in your diet? So we were able to narrow that down to three research projects and we developed collateral materials so that when those reps went into those physicians, they didn't have time to talk to a 15 page research project. You just gave them the highlights. So the program started off in Dallas and Houston. We had one rep in Dallas, one rep in Houston. After six months, after reading reports, the board said, we're putting more money into this. We hired an additional rep in Dallas, additional rep in Houston. And so we've grown that to add additional reps in Austin and in San Antonio. So you have six reps calling on cardiologists and physicians around in the large metropolitan areas. To date, we've reached over 9,800 physicians. Now, have we convinced every physician? No, we haven't. But the interesting thing is when I look at preliminary informal surveys of the physicians that we visited, 97% have looked at the information that they have received and are more favorable, favorable to your product. So that's huge. Not only are you helping patients that have high cholesterol that they've been told, you need to go on the DASH diet. Well, if you go on the DASH diet, you might as well not eat any, pretty much any animal protein. But the, but the beef in an optimal lean diet, five to seven ounces, people will stay on that diet. And so it not only helps the patient, but just think about the potential of nine million more consumers of your product that are out there and you're helping answer those questions about diet health issues. These are some of the partners that we work with in the retail food service chain. Uh, whether I'm talking about retail or food service, about promotion and education. This is some of the partnership that you will see this summer around the state of Texas. And so as we, and so we're, either promoting or cross-promoting companies or products that complement beef uh, from April, May and August through September, we'll be partnering with Fiesta Seasoning. Uh, we'll have two wine promotions and it'll be also couponing on beef uh, with San Genevieve Wine. That promotion will run from May through July. Gallo Wines will run from July through August. In addition to the cross promotions, we'll also be doing more than 150 in-store demo days in three retail, super, uh, three, tel, three retail accounts, July through September. And so as we think about the education part of it, who has more contact with the consumer than a retailer? And I'm sad to say that a lot of retailers or the people that are selling your product really don't know how to offer a suggestion of a cut, a cooking method, uh, how to prepare it. And so we bring in, whether it's HEB or Kroger or United, we do boot camps. We typically do 10 to 11 a year. And we talk, teach them about beef. We teach them about nutrition, cutting, cooking, selecting, so that when that customer comes up to that meat counter, they are a little bit better prepared about what they should or shouldn't uh, recommend to it to one of their customers. The same can also be said for the food service sector. It's about promotion and education. And as we look at, as we think about this, and again, telling the story about what you do in the industry, uh, these retail, to, these industry tours, you can call them farm to fork, you can call them gate to plate, I don't care what you call them. But what it does, it, it enables the key influencers from retail, food service, health professionals, dietitians, and other media, we're able to take them to your operations and showcase what you do. Because most of these people will never set foot on a ranch, they'll never see a feed yard, they'll never see a packing plant. We have a wonderful story to tell. Sometimes I'm not sure we do a good, good enough job telling that story. So uh, beef tours continues to be very important for us. And so as we think about kind of amplifying the beef message, I want to share a, one video clip that is a series that we're working with CBS News Digital in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And again, trying to amplify the beef message. So uh, see if this, this works for you. 
Hi, I'm Amanda Guerra for Dine, brought to you by the Texas Beef Council. We are here with one of my favorites, Chef John Tisar at his restaurant, Knife in Dallas, recently named Best Steakhouse, I believe. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Tell us about this second dish. So this is another share dish, and it's kind of one of my favorites. So we came up with a way, we do, we do them sous vide. So I, I put them in a bag, we cook them uh, for three whole days at about 135 degrees to keep this beautiful... Three days. Three days. Okay. And it's just to keep this beautiful medium, medium rare color. If the Texas Beef Council at Texas is all about steak, this is what beef tastes like to me. And when you cook your beef, do you put a lot of stuff on it or are you just kind of a salt and pepper, if that sort of person? You're exactly right. It's salt, salt and pepper. That's the one That's thing... That's all you need. I'm a New Yorker, but Texas has taught me that the cow just needs a little salt and pepper on it. <laughs> And you're all set. You let the meat speak for itself. Let the meat speak for itself. All right, we're gonna cut into this. Anywhere you like. No, you need to have some too. I'll let you, you go. Cook I'll this. let you go first. See how tender I'm that is. Worried about being moist. dainty. Yeah. You see it? It's no, amazing. just stick right in. Steak. Mmm. And it doesn't have your typical short rib, you know, like braised flavor. Mm-hmm. Mmm. See how so tender smooth. and smooth that is. Mmm. It's That's very really silky. I don't know if you can describe meat that way, but it's, it's silky, kind of what it tastes like. It's silky and it's very, I call that lush. Mm -hmm. Better you know, word. It has less chew than a steak, but true beef flavor. Yeah, it's incredible. All right, so tell us about our third dish that we're gonna have. The next dish we're going to have is I'm gonna do a, a steak au poivre. So I'm, I'm a European trained chef. It's a Texas steakhouse, so I wanted to come up with an alternative to just ribeye, sirloin, and regular filet. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing an au poivre sauce, we do a real au poivre in the pan. Um, we use uh, 44 Farms tenderloin. I crust it with black pepper, and then it's just brandy, mustard, a little beef stock, and you're That's all set. It. All That's right. it, all right, we're gonna show you guys that coming up next time. Thanks for being with us. You know, as I look around the group today, I bet most of y'all spend a lot of time in shop or working on cars in, in high school. But do you realize that there are over 300 high schools in the state of Texas that have a culinary arts program? That blew me away when I heard that number. And so how do we do a better job of educating that next generation of the food service industry or the next up and coming chef? And so we partner with what we call them the culinary culinary educators, teachers of the state of Texas. We bring them in typically every year for two-day session and it's gonna be all things beef. Uh, but we also provide hands-on education and, and help develop, develop their culinary activities so that they can keep their students up to speed on the, the latest information about beef. So as we get closer to the home base here, let's talk a little bit about exports. And if you believe that 94% of the world lives outside the United States, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to promote your product around the world. And so it's about finding, really finding the right cut for the right market. And as you can see from the picture, I don't know if you can see very well, uh, the wording on there, but it's about the different varieties of cuts being shipped around the world. And whether it's chuck rolls or clods to Northern Asia or goosenecks to Canada and Mexico, or short ribs worldwide, where's the, where can we add more value? And I just want to give you a couple examples. Let's look at Chuck short ribs, and let's just say they are selling for $6.62 a pound. In the global market, that's $7.97 a pound. That's about 17% increase. Short plates, buck fifty in the U.S., $3.54 a pound in the global market. So again, as we, what does that, how does that impact the profitability of our industry in delivering product that consumers were on? We've already heard a little bit about the variety meats. Um, they're a big deal. How many of y'all have had tongue in the last month? <laughs> Two. How many of you have had liver in the last month? A little bit more. You know, my mother used to love liver and onions, but I couldn't stand them. But you know, there's a lot of people in the world who love livers, who love tongue, who will eat kidneys, who will eat heart, 
And so where do we add value? And again, whether it's the primals or the variety meats, it gives us great opportunity. So here's another example. Tongues in the U.S., $3.94 a pound. In the global market, $5.30 a pound. Livers, for all you liver lovers, $0.20 cents a pound versus $0.53 cents a pound in the global market. Now that's 165% premium if you're selling that project product to the Middle East. That's a big deal. And so we talked. Some of the previous speakers have talked about the importance of the international market. R counted for about almost 13% of the production last year, and 2017 was an amazing year for export on a volume and value basis. I know that. Uh, the Califax speaker, he combined beef, beef variety meats and hides, total value of over $350. But if you look at just the beef and the beef variety meats, for every fed steer and heifer in the U.S., that's about $286 per head. That adds more money in your pocket. And so as you look at the growth of the international market, the Texas Beef Council, through that original dollar, has been investing your dollars in the global market for more than 30 years, well, uh, probably 25 years to be exact. And so when you combine the Texas Beef Council investment with the state checkoff investment to USMEF, Texas is now the fourth largest investor to the US Meat Export Federation behind the USDA's market access program, behind the national beef checkoff, and behind the pork checkoff because USMEF is a multi-species organization. And so we've tried to put your dollars where it will give you the biggest bang for your buck. So let's take a look at some of these. In the international market, you can see most of the growth came in the Asian market, but all markets were up. On a volume basis, we sold more than 2.7 billion pounds of beef and variety meats around the world. On a value basis, a record year in 2017, $7.27 billion worth of beef and beef variety meats. And that's up 15% over 2016. And so that's been a huge year for us. And so as, we, so, as you, so as you ask yourself, what does the state checkoff meant to the international markets? Well, we use these dollars. We bring a lot of groups into Texas, showcasing our industry. We we'll also, and whether they're retailers or food service operators or big uh, hotel properties, we'll showcase the industry and then we will bring them into the office for a day, day and a half and we'll spend that time cooking U.S. beef, cutting U.S. beef, uh, seasoning U.S. beef to help them better understand the product so that when they go back and, and, and promote our product in those markets, they have a better understanding. And so we also partner with the U.S. Meat Export Federation. These are just some examples of the seminars and promotions that we have conducted on your behalf just in 2017. And so maybe to put this all in perspective as we think about this last side, everything you see in black would, a thing, would a be programs we would have executed under your 50 cents of your national checkoff. So when you combine that with the red, which would be your state checkoff money, you can see a significant amount of your dollars are being invested in the global marketplace to grow demand for your product. And so hopefully I've given you just a quick 45 minute overview of how your dollars are being utilized. I could probably go in and talk about international markets for an hour, probably talk about retail for an hour, but I know you don't have that much time because you don't want to be here till midnight. But the one thing I do want to say is thank you for your continued support for really for the national checkoff for more than 30 years, but also seeing a need to add an additional dollar for the state checkoff the boards of not only the Texas Beef Council, but the Beef Promotion Research Council, they're all checkoff paying members. They come from all different segments and industry organizations, but when they come, my, when we do new director orientation, what I tell each board member that comes in, I said, take your hat off at the door, and your job is to focus on helping be a catalyst to increase beef demand. I, don't, I know politics are important, we're not going to play politics. We're going to do what's right by the producers and do the very best job that we can do each and every day to help be a catalyst to be increase beef demand. Here's some websites you can go 
If you say, I don't ever see anything or hear anything, go to that texasbeefcheckoff.com. That is a producer website. It'll tell you how your dollars are being utilized in Texas. If you want to see how those dollars are being invested nationally, go to mybeefcheckoff.com. And for those of you who want to get more beef information, go to that Beef Loving Texans website. Give us your feedback because we're proud of it. And uh, it's, it is a very important tool to disseminate the beef information. So, again, thank you for your continued support. We don't get up here as much as we need to or should, but thanks for Andy and, and the Hemp Hill County Beef Committee and all your team. And I do want to give a shout out to Joe over here. He saved me on my, 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 uh, my video presentations, but this is a first class run program, I will tell you. I've been to a lot of them, and I don't know that I can remember one that has been better organized and, and more receptive to the people that have been in, uh, that come to this meeting. So you, you're truly blessed to have a group of people that are passionate about doing a good job for you as producers.